Hey guys, welcome back. It's been about two months since I installed my pair of EG4 6000 XP inverters. They were put into service around June, middle of June 2024, so I thought it would be a good time to give an update on how the inverters are doing, some of the other things going on in the battery shed, and just around the channel in general. So I haven't really done a whole lot since that last video. Um, I've done some basic wire cleanup and management and things like that, but largely the inverters just work. I don't have to come out here and touch them. They've been working since I installed them in June. There have been absolutely no issues with the inverters themselves since I have installed them and have been using them. Now I did experience one issue with the wireless dongles on the inverters on one of the inverters. As I had mentioned in my previous video, there was a concern with the security of the wireless dongles because it is broadcasting an open SSID with no encryption, no password. Uh, EG4 has since pushed out a firmware that fixes that, uh, and as far as I know, you have to ask them specifically to load that firmware to your dongles. And once that is installed, an option is made available in the app that allows you to put a password on that SSID that's broadcasting. Uh, however, through the process of tinkering around with the Wi-Fi dongles and trying to figure things out myself, one of them did stop working. It was no longer connecting to EG4's cloud platform, even though it, it did appear to be connected to the internet. Uh, so EG4 was unable to fix that and Current Connected, the place where I purchased both of these inverters from, actually shipped me out a new wireless dongle under warranty. Uh, so the issue has been resolved and thank you Current Connected for taking care of that so quickly. Other than that, there have been no issues with any of this hardware. Um, I have since set up Solar Assistant. I'm now running Solar Assistant to pull, pull statistics from these inverters because they're still operating in offline mode. So. Uh, they're on a wireless SSID and a wireless VLAN that does not have connection to the internet. That's just for my own uh, security and privacy peace of mind. There's a lot that I can say on Solar Assistant that it really needs its own video. So it's a great platform, but there's so much that it can do. It's got so much potential that it's not doing currently. And, and I really need to spend some time collecting all of my thoughts on these various ideas and send them over to the developer and see if they have any interest in doing anything about them. Just basic things like it, it requires a Raspberry Pi and I would much rather load it on a virtual machine. Um, it does not allow you to specify inverter devices by IP address, it has to do a scan. Uh, so you can't have the solar assistant on a different subnet as your wireless dongles. They have to both be on, they have to all be on the same subnet. And then just some statistics gathering in general. So, uh, but let's take a quick look at where we are since June. Now these statistics aren't 100% accurate because there's been a lot of downtime of the Raspberry Pi, um, just from power outages and stuff like that. And there've been a few times the inverters have been shut off so I can do electrical work in the house. Uh, so I'm gonna try to get all of this stuff ironed out for the start of September 1st. That way I can say as of September 1st, these statistics are 100% accurate. I'm gonna get the Raspberry Pi on a UPS. Nothing should be going offline at that point. Uh, but taking a look at where we are currently, in the month of June, I produced 156 kilowatt hours of solar. 100 kilowatts went out to loads. Uh, July, I produced 756 kilowatt hours of solar and 570 kilowatt hours went out to the loads. And then in August so far, I've produced 525 kilowatt hours with 398 going out to the loads. Now, my, my power cost here from the power company is roughly 12 cents per hour. That is all inclusive. That's the amount I write a check for and I just divide it by the kilowatt hours used. So that includes taxes, fees, all of that crap that gets put on your power bill. So that gives me roughly $48 worth in August, $69 in July, and then $12 in June for a total of $130 so far. It doesn't sound like a lot, uh, and it's, it's really not a lot, uh, but I'm hoping that gets better here now that there's less downtime for maintenance issues. I need to reconfigure my third solar array. I've reconfigured arrays one and two so far, but I haven't done number three yet. Uh, and I'm still in the market for a few panels. I'd like to get the same Sun Edison brand that I have on arrays one and two, so I can expand that array further, but uh, Sun Edison went bankrupt, I believe, or there was something, I think they went bankrupt, they're no longer making panels, so it's been difficult to find. Uh, and then at, again, as of September 1st, when I know I have 100% accurate statistics, we can take a look at the efficiency of some of this stuff. For example, looking at August, uh, I produced 525 from the solar, 400 went out to the loads. So where did all the rest of that power go? That's 125 kilowatt hours lost. Was that 125 kilowatt hours lost in conversion from solar DC to battery DC, then up to AC and the fans and all of the stuff that the inverters consume? Aside from that, like I said, I haven't really done a whole lot with the inverters. 
I've done some basic cable cleanup. I still need to do the grounding. I need to do a better job with the grounding. Somebody pointed out in my video that my main means of ground, the main ground bar needs to be in the wire trough. Uh, so that's what I'd like to do. And I have a ground bar. I have a 1032, I think it is. Was it code requires a 1032 thread when you're attaching a ground bar to an enclosure. I just need to get the hole drilled and the bar mounted and a bunch of little things like that. I'm hoping I can wrap up here as we move into the fall, certainly before winter. If you're interested in purchasing inverters or any SOK batteries or anything like that, uh, Current Connected is doing a special promotion through the end of August. They gave a coupon code which gives free shipping. Uh, so if you buy rack mount batteries, especially because of the shipping costs on lithium batteries, uh, you're, you're saving three, four, five hundred dollars easily with that discount code, depending on the amount of batteries you buy. So let's move on to the DIY battery bank, which is sitting over here on my left. I haven't really shown that yet, and it's pretty much done at this point. So this is the final mounting setup I've decided on, and it's taken a lot of time to get to this point. If you've been following this channel, you know I've tried many, many mounting techniques and packing techniques for these batteries over the course of two to three years really. Uh, and this is sort of what I settled on and I really like how it's come out. So this is standard strut channel. It's one and five eighths I think. And I've spaced it out such that the width of the strut is pretty much the same width of the battery. That way the battery is actually resting on the metal strut. It's no longer resting on a wood shelf. It's not a wire shelf. It's nothing like that. It's a solid piece of steel. I use some half inch bolts here and this, these thick pieces of steel, I'm not sure what you call them. Now, isolation of anything metal from the case of the battery is crucial. On all sides of these batteries, except for the top, I have this quarter inch uh, cement board. This is hardy backer board. You can see I have a piece in the back, got a piece down here, and I've got a piece on the bottom. I've cut this to the correct size. I've painted it with a primer meant for cement board and then I spray painted it with black just so it looks nice. It also prevents the dust from flaking off. And then on the left and right side, I have quarter inch thick steel plate. Um, I got this steel plate on eBay. It was pre-cut to the exact size I needed. And I just uh, brushed off the top coating a little bit and primed and painted that as well. Then I drilled some holes for the threaded rod. This is 3 8 inch threaded rod serrated flange nuts. Now those are not compressing the cells, they're simply holding them in place, fixing them in place. In between the cells I have 1 8 inch strips of uh, neoprene closed cell foam. It's been perfect so far. I used flexible bus bars and you can see my balance leads running down the center of the pack as well. Those balance leads are going over to the K9. This is a Batrium balancer. So I've got a K9 for the top shelf and then I've got a K9 for the bottom shelf. Uh, and then I've got uh, number two wire comes off the positive and the negative. Uh, it goes into this 100 amp Nader circuit breaker. So this is a DC rated breaker and it just mostly allows for a means of disconnect when I need to service things. Uh, so this system in my opinion has worked out absolutely perfect. There's room to add more to the top there, although I don't really plan on adding any more at this point, simply because I'm becoming overrun with 48 volt server rack batteries. So I'm still running the same four from SOK. Uh, I've got a fifth SOK down there. That's their basic version. I don't think they sell that one anymore, but I do need to get that one connected. I've got an original EG4 Life Power 4, the Jacoper down there. Uh, and then I've got the new Basin Green that I built in a prior video. Uh, so those cells are done balancing at this point. I just need to clean back there so I can slide it back under the rack. It is a bit longer than the 100 amp hour batteries just because of the form factor of the cells. And then I'm hoping to pick up a second one that I can put on the right side with the other 16 cells. I do have a company, I think, sending out another enclosure that's different from this one. Uh, now you'll notice I did modify this because it didn't have a circuit breaker and that sort of bothered me a bit. So I took out the original push button switch that was in there. It's a Nader 125 amp. And I took the positive lead, made a little pigtail that goes into the side. And then that comes out to the bus bar and it also feeds the BMS off of that breaker. So when I flip the breaker, it shuts down the entire thing. Again, not really for overcurrent protection, but more as a means of disconnect for servicing. One other thing I wanted to talk about is just the means for which I mounted my IMO disconnect here at my primary solar array. And this was an idea I had seen uh, on another channel that was done by someone who's actually a licensed electrician. Uh, as you may know, I am not. But he showed me these, they're called Myers hubs or conduit hubs, and they look like this. And this is something I didn't know had even existed. So it's a weatherproof conduit hub. 
Uh, you can see you go, this is a three quarter inch, is it a one? No, this is a three quarter inch hole. Uh, and then it's weatherproof. So it's got a rubber gasket here, the black gasket that goes on the outside, which you can see mounted there. Uh, and then it's just threaded on the top. So I used a three quarter inch chase nipple on the top of that to go into the IMO disconnect. So this is a great way to mount these disconnects. And it's actually set away from the four x four just enough that I can put this low profile strut channel back there. So I do need to cut a piece that's wide enough or long enough rather. At the same time, I need to pull this ground wire through, but I am waiting on grounding those three panels at the top there uh, with that extra slack you see hanging before I can complete this step. That brings me to the next step of the little rack thing I built on the top of my uh, eight foot shipping uh, quadcon shipping container here, just to mount those three panels. They're no longer flat. You can see there's quite a bit of space between the top of the panel and the bottom of the container. And by doing that, it's trapping less heat, much less heat under the panels. So the container as a whole is significantly cooler. Even with that two inch foam I have in there, this made a huge difference getting those panels lifted up at an angle as opposed to having them flat on the container. Ah, I think that's a good place to wrap up this update. I was hoping it'd be a quick update, uh, but something tells me the length of time I talked is going to end up being a 10 or 15 minute video. If you are interested in purchasing these inverters, uh, SLK batteries or anything the current connected cells, the free shipping discount is good until the end of August. It's very rare that you see free shipping from them with no order, you know, order quantity restriction. Uh, sometimes they offer free shipping on like eight or 10,000 numbers, amounts that the typical person probably wouldn't purchase. In the next few months, there's going to be a lot of battery views. It seems like the floodgates have opened all of a sudden and I've been getting dozens of emails from all over the place. Uh, and I've accepted a few battery offers. So. so we will be seeing some more review videos here soon. If there's any other content types you guys wanna see, let me know that as well. Hit that like button before you go and thanks for watching.